Hey everyone, and welcome back to my Making a Coil Gun series. Last episode, I introduced the series as well as covered the basics of how a coil gun works. In this video, I'm going to show how we can use capacitors to improve our launches. Before we get too into the episode though, I wanted to mention I'm launching a new channel called Reed's Projects. It's up here on the screen. I'm going to move the coil gun project to my other series style videos over there. If you're interested in that, I'm going to have a bonus coil gun video on there where I'm testing these coils out. Now last episode, I was using my power supply to magnetize this coil. The setup was working to launch some paper clips a few inches. There are two main issues with using my power supply to power the coil directly though. The first issue is that it's connected to my wall, which limits the portability of the gun. I could possibly power the supply off of some batteries, but this is where the second issue comes in. The max current of the supply is only 5 amps. This is a little problematic as we need more current to create a larger magnetic field that can accelerate the projectile faster. 5 amps just isn't a lot of current. If we want a more powerful magnetic field, and that's achieved through more current, how can we increase the current then? Well, there are two main ways to go about that. This equation determines the current we can achieve. E, which stands for electromotive force, is just a really fancy name for voltage. I, which is thought to have meant intensity, is just a fancy name for current. And then finally there's R, which actually makes sense and just represents resistance. These three things all come together to form this equation. Current is voltage divided by resistance. I've loosely covered what current is, but voltage and resistance I haven't touched on at all. Basically, voltage is the pressure or force trying to push electrons through the wire. The higher the voltage, the larger this pressure is. Resistance is the opposition to this pressure. Increasing the resistance will, well, increase the resistance to this pressure. Current is the flow of electrons. Increasing the pressure for electrons to flow or decreasing the resistance against those electrons will increase the flow of electrons. So this means that either decreasing the resistance of our circuit or increasing the voltage will increase the current. We can actually do both here. Let's first talk about lowering the resistance. Since the only component in our circuit is the coil, the resistance is coming almost entirely from that. Looking at the construction of the coil, it's just made from one really long strand of wire. The resistance of the wire is determined by quite a few things, but the two I'm going to be focusing on is the length of the wire and the thickness of the wire. The first is using thicker wire, which has less resistance than thin wire does per foot. Here I have two 10 foot sections of wire. This one is 22 gauge and this one is 16 gauge. I have my ohm meter here, and you can see that the resistance of the small wire is about double that of the thicker wire. The thicker wire can also carry more current before it starts burning, which is important. Wait, I ended up using this 16 gauge wire for testing, which is a little on the thin side as it was getting a little warm during some of my shots, so I might go for thicker wire in the final design, but it's working well enough for now. The second thing we can do is have less windings in our coil. This lowers the length of wire needed to make the coil, which lowers the resistance of the coil. I have a similar setup here with two wires, one shorter than the other this time, and the shorter wire is about half the resistance of the larger wire. The big sticking point with this approach is that having less loops in our coil creates a smaller magnetic field. It decreases the resistance of the coil, which increases the current and therefore the magnetic field, but at the expense of decreasing the number of windings, which decreases the magnetic field. Lowering the number of windings isn't really a viable way of increasing the current in this case since it also shrinks the magnetic field which is the exact opposite reason we're trying to increase the current in the first place. So that won't work, but we can still use thicker wire to decrease the resistance of the coil. What if we try increasing the voltage going into the coil as well? Right now the supply is outputting about 3 volts, but we can do much better than that. Not with this supply though, as we've already maxed out its current limit. We need a power source that can deliver high voltage and sustain high current. We can use a capacitor for this. Capacitors store energy within an electric field and can discharge it very quickly. They're great for delivering quick spikes of high current. If I charge one of these guys up to about 30 volts and then short the output, we get a nice spark. Using our equation, we have a very low resistance output and a relatively high voltage. This means that we get an extremely high amount of current, maybe about 100 amps, through this piece of metal. This only occurs for a split second though, as in the capacitor discharges and has no voltage across it, creating no current. This is actually perfectly fine though, as the coil should only be powered for a quick second to accelerate the projectile anyways, otherwise the projectile gets stuck in the center of the coil, as I've shown before. Capacitors can be a little dangerous though, and that's especially true with the ones we'll be dealing with. These are all polarized, meaning that if you hook them up backwards, things get ugly. So I'm going to do that here. Remember how it charges up to 30 volts? Let's see how it links that across it backwards. 
So I have these two leads running to the capacitor up there, and one is already hooked to my supply. When I touch this other one to my supply as well, it should explode after a few seconds. Nice. Really, there's no practical reason for me to do that, besides to show you that these things can and will explode if mistreated. Now that little guy that just detonated was rated at 35 volts and 1000 microfarads. The voltage rating is the max voltage this can tolerate before exploding, and the 1000 microfarads is its capacitance. More capacitance loosely means the more energy that it can store. Enter this dude. This guy is like a soup can, and this is what I'm planning to use to power the coils. You might wonder what the capacity of this thing is compared to the small ones I've been dealing with. 100 times? 1000 times? Actually, it might be a little confusing, but it's only 3,900 microfarads, which is roughly four times more than the small capacitors. Why is this thing so much more massive, then? Well, it can be charged up to 550 volts, which is way more than the 35 that the other ones can handle. Since more voltage can give us more current and therefore better launches, this should really step up our game. Let's test this thing out. I'm going to charge it up to about 35 volts since that's the max my supply can handle. I really don't want this thing to explode, so it's important to check that the positive terminal of my supply is definitely hooked to the positive terminal on the capacitor, and the negative ones are connected together as well. Alright, it should be charged up. I can check that with my meter, and yup, that's like 35 volts. If I set my paperclip on the edge of the coil and connect the two terminals of my capacitor to the exposed wires, that was much better than last episode. That was a few hundred amps in the coil for a split second there. Not bad considering it was charged to less than a tenth of its maximum voltage rating. I just maxed out the voltage of my supply though, so we need a new power source that can deliver higher voltage to charge these capacitors from. Now is where things are going to get dangerous. Here is a $10 voltage converter I bought on Amazon. It takes in about 20 volts on the input, and outputs up to 400 volts. We can power this board off my power supply, and then charge the capacitors from its output. This is now getting high enough in voltage that I really don't want to have to touch anything once it's live. 400 volts is not really a great thing to have across your body in that you'll die. I need a way to safely charge up this capacitor and then connect it to the coil. When I was charging it for the first time, you may have noticed I was using a resistor connected to a clip lead to touch the positive terminal of my supply to the capacitor. By doing this, I'm touching the rubbery material of this clip, isolating myself from the voltage going into the capacitor. As for the resistor, it lets me limit the current going into the capacitor, which charges it slower. I do this in case something goes wrong, I have a little bit more time to react. As for discharging, connecting the leads directly like this isn't a great strategy. The spark you saw during my 30 volt test was already quite bright and hot, and the higher voltage I try will only make that brighter and hotter. This is a problem because at some point it's gonna melt the wire. Molten metal and hot bright objects inside of an enclosed space like a gun is probably a really bad idea. Lastly, I would like a computer to be able to tell the gun exactly when to fire. This allows the gun to precisely time when to dump the capacitor's energy into the coil, which will be an important factor next episode when we have multiple coils to fire. Ideally, there would be some component that could act like a switch to hold off the high voltage of the capacitor until some signal comes through. Once that signal comes, the capacitor knows to dump its energy into the coil. These should work. These three-legged things are SCRs, or Silicon Controlled Rectifiers. The symbol for these looks like a diode with an extra lead on it. Normal diodes only let current flow in one direction, and block it from going in the other. SCRs do the same thing, but with an extra feature. They have an extra lead that's called the gate. This name kind of describes the function, where only when the gate passes a relatively small amount of current, the current across the main junction can flow. That extra lead is acting like a gate, controlling the main load. The key there though is that when a small amount of current on the gate is created, a large current can flow through the diode. We can therefore connect the capacitor and coil together through the main terminals, and control when the capacitor discharges using a safe low voltage on the gate. You'll see I also have one of the leads to the battery connecting back to where the capacitor is. This is to connect the ground of the battery to the ground of the capacitor so that they're referenced towards each other. I have my SCR hooked up here. One of the terminals is going to the positive of the capacitor. The other one is going to the coil. And on the gate, I have this resistor and wire that I can tap against this 9 volt battery to turn on the switch. That way, the only thing I'm ever touching is this battery, which is totally safe. As for why I'm using a resistor, it's just to limit the current going into the gate so I don't accidentally blow it up or something. I'm going to be charging this capacitor up to about 100 volts through this little board I have and I'm going to discharge it into the coil using this SCR. I have the control pin of my SCR here, and I could touch this to the positive of my 9 volt battery to dump the capacitor's energy into the coil, 
I can still charge up the capacitor with this resistor and clip lead, and I have the voltage across the capacitor displayed on my meter. So now the capacitor is charged up, I should be able to just connect this extra lead I have for the gate pin up to the battery, and this should allow a little bit of current to flow, which should open that gate and allow it to discharge through the coil. We can see if that worked by checking the voltage of the capacitor, which is now basically zero. So that means everything should be working since the capacitor discharged itself fully through the coil. Let's try to fire a paper clip now. I'm going to be switching to this coil since it has a longer barrel in it, and it gives a bit more room for the paper clip to sit and accelerate. If you want to see how I made these, I also have that in my other video. I know I promoted it like eight times now, but it's in that video. So I can charge up the capacitor again, and if I touch the gate lead against the battery, not too bad. Knocked that box over and actually ended up back in the barrel. I think I'll end the episode here though, since the next thing I want to do is add more coils and more capacitors. If you want to see me launch some more objects, make sure to check out my projects channel where I have that extra video. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to my projects channel if you want to continue seeing more of this series. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask below. Until next time.